This episode is brought to you by Sol de Janeiro. At Sol de Janeiro, touch isn't just for screens. Physical connection is so essential to how we communicate. It's infused in everything we offer. Sense so irresistible, PDA is guaranteed. Textures are so luscious, skin is huggable. Get into a Sol de Janeiro state of mind. Receive 10% off on your first order on soldejanero.com. Plus free shipping with the code soldejanero10. We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to a special mini-sode of Yield Crime, the show where Maddie and I discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear every Wednesday. This special bi-weekly segment is called Can You Crack the Cramp Word, which is slang for a difficult or obscure term, which I thought was very fitting. And joining me today is Lo from the Milk Making Minutes podcast. And before we begin, I'd like to give her the opportunity to tell us a little more about herself and her show before we get started. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here because I love (laughs) your podcast. I'm like a new and forever fan. (laughs) So my name is Lo Nightgrash, and I am a lactation consultant, which is kind of funny because it really has nothing to do with true crime or history. But, you know, I think some of your listeners might be interested if they are parents at all, because I focus, the Milk Making Minutes really focuses on the baby feeding struggles through the lens of systemic and cultural barriers. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has ever tried to feed a baby knows that it can be really challenging to feed a baby with their body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so even though I'm a lactation consultant and I love human milk feeding, What I love more than that is healthy and happy families. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that human milk feeding has become so difficult given all the challenges that families face today. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we look at people's stories. People come on and they share their baby feeding stories. And I... What I hope to do is if somebody, especially if somebody has not processed their story at all, I kind of walk them through their story. And then by the end, often somebody, often people have already processed their story really fully, but if they haven't, they sometimes see, ah, like that's why it was so challenging for me. Mm -hmm. Or I will do voiceovers so that by the end, the listeners understand, ah, that's where it went wrong. But my hope is that both listeners and guests feel by listening through my story that they understand that failures were never personal failures. Mm -hmm. And that the triumphs that they feel are truly miracles. You know, sometimes we feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was able to do that. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it feels like a miracle. And I'm here to tell you, yes, it really was a miracle given all that you had to face to make that happen. Exactly. So that's what my show is about. Awesome. Yeah. So that is the perfect segue to my first question, which is what got you interested in becoming a lactation consultant? Like many people who enter this field, it was through my own deep struggle Mm-hmm. I think there's, you know, I have met lactation consultants who have never fed babies with their own bodies. And I think that's totally great because you can be a lactation consultant without having done it. Mm-hmm. And I, But I think those of us who have fed babies with their own bodies, there's one of two camps. Those who just felt like goddesses as they did it. And this is the most amazing <laughs> thing. And I want everybody to do it. And then there's people like me who are like, oh, my gosh, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I struggled so much. And mm-hmm. I would like to reduce that struggle for other people and reduce that feeling of guilt and reduce the, the hardship mm-hmm. in some way. And there is so much that goes wrong in maternal fetal health. And I would like to contribute to reducing how much struggle there is in that field. And so I decided to become a lactation consultant nine years ago when I walked into 
the IBCLC who really impacted me when I walked into her office and I had my first visit towards the end of the visit. I was like, how do you do this? How do you become a lactation consultant? And she told me and I was like, oh my gosh, that's going to take me forever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I became a CLC first, which is a certified lactation counselor about five or six years ago. And then this fall, I was finally able to sit for the board exam and become an international board certified lactation consultant. So now I'm an IBCLC. Like, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it was a long road, but I'm finally there. There you go. In the course of running your podcast, what is a common issue or misconception that keeps popping up when interviewing your guests? Hmm. A common issue that I see is that doctors and nurses know a lot Mm -hmm. about baby feeding. And I love doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. I rely on them heavily for my own children's care. And I also have to remind my own clients that Doctors have extensive training to care for a wide scope from the time your baby is born until they're 18 or if they're a family doctor for the whole scope of life. Mm -hmm. And so their training on those years when your baby is born is very limited. They receive like three to nine hours of training for Mm -hmm. lactation or baby feeding if any, in med school. And so they really don't have very much training when it comes to baby feeding. And often the training that they or the advice that they're doling out has to do more with their own experience feeding their children if they are parents than what they have received in medical school. Whereas Mm. lactation consultants, we don't have that wide scope, like, you know, for the whole lifespan or for the whole childhood, but Mm -hmm. we have extensive training in those months or years that you would be feeding a baby. So we have very deep knowledge for a very short time period. Mm -hmm. And so doctors often don't know what they don't know when it comes to baby feeding because it's not presented in med school. Sure. Last question. Mm -hmm. If you could give just one piece of advice to our listeners who are either pregnant, planning to get pregnant, or interested in breastfeeding, what would it be? I would tell them, if they can, to book a consult with a lactation consultant prenatally Mm -hmm. because often your insurance will cover it and get some one-on-one advice that is specific to you and your body. And you can call around so you can figure out, because sometimes lactation consultants, they're like any other profession, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. you might call somebody and you're like, yeah, that is not the person for me. They're gonna judge me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They Mm -hmm. are not going to help me get to my goals because you might be thinking, you know, I'm not going to breastfeed at all costs. I might like to do some kind of combo or I might like to try it out. I might not, I might like to see how it works for me, which is a totally acceptable goal. And Mm -hmm. so you might call around and try to find the person who truly gets what your goals are and then say, you know, I would like to get a consult with you prenatally. So I know how to set myself up for success Mm -hmm. in the hospital to reach my goals so that you feel less anxious once the baby is there. And then if you run into any problems, you already know who you're going to call or text once that happens, because anyone who has a baby knows what it feels like in those first days or weeks or hours to be feeling like, oh my gosh, my baby's hungry and I need to feed them and I'm Mm -hmm. super stressed out and I don't know who to call and it doesn't feel like there's anybody available So to have that person already saved in your phone feels like it eliminates so much stress. That makes so much sense. And Mm -hmm. that's now that you're saying that it is reminding me. And I know for our listeners, we literally just got off an interview for Lowe's show where I shared my own breastfeeding story. And I didn't think about it when we were talking But I recall that when I was doing the prenatal thing for my second, that they had us do a special parenting class, even though 
we'd already had a child, but it's it was required that we take another parenting class. And it was at a lactation place. And mm-hmm. I didn't really think about it until later that so much of it revolved around breastfeeding and it made me feel a little bit better that I was in a space where at least I think that all of these new parents that was their plan and that was their Mm. goal Mm -hmm. and I don't know obviously I didn't know any of these people so I don't know if all of them followed through with that if they were successful with it any of that but I think my husband and I were the peop- the only people in the class who had already had children. Mm-hmm. So we kind of knew what to expect with children. And so it was so interesting hearing the questions they were asking. And at the same time, it was also helpful for me as somebody who hadn't breastfed before to be like, oh, I never would have thought of asking that question. Mm. So I do think it was helpful. And even if it's something that a, someone who would not have wanted to breastfeed went to that type of class i think it still would have been informative for them so maybe it could have swayed their opinion or made them think about something that perhaps they hadn't thought of as part of their prenatal journey you know before they had their child about well maybe i maybe i do want to try it maybe this is something that would be beneficial not just for me but also for my child and so it was just very interesting i don't know why i didn't think of it while we were talking but Oh yeah. As you were saying that I was like, "Oh yeah, I did I went to this place and it was Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of cool. Yeah. And you know, even if somebody, you know, sometimes I talk to people who are like, "I do not want to breastfeed once I leave the hospital, but I just want my baby to get colostrum." Sure. I can totally yes. work with that and I can help people with that. Or I say I I talk to people who are like, "You know, I do not want to feed my baby directly from my body, but I do want to pump." And I can help people with that. Or as you and I are talk- were talking about, people who decide I do not want to breastfeed or chest feed or provide any kind of milk at all to my baby from my body, that milk, if you have mm-hmm. mammary glands, is going to come whether you want it to or not. And so if that yes. is your plan and you would like to talk to a lactation consultant prenatally to figure out how you mitigate and make sure that you do not get engorged or have plugged ducts or lead to mastitis, which can lead to abscesses if you don't care for it properly. It is still great to get your insurance to pay for that lactation consult Mm -hmm. prenatally so that you know how to care for yourself and deal with that milk because most hospitals are not going to do the best job. In fact, I work at a hospital twice a month just to like know kind of what's going on in the hospitals as a lactation consultant. Most of my work is private practice. And if somebody says they are feeding formula, we, there's just too many patients that we're seeing who are breastfeeding. So we just cross them off our list and we're not even going into those rooms to check in on them. Do I Mm -hmm. wish the system was different? It is a systemic failure. So yes, I wish that we could come in and say, we know your formula feeding. We are the lactation team. We are not trying to sway you another way, but we just want to let you know your milk is going to come in. This is how you can care for your body to make sure that you don't feel pain, that you don't get overly engorged. But the nurses don't really do a great job of that typically. Uh So if you want to use your insurance, the Affordable Care Act requires that insurance companies pay for typically about six visits with a lactation consultant. And typically that that can happen, at least one of those visits can happen prenatally. That's awesome. And if anyone wants to, you know, book with me, I can do virtual visits. So awesome. Yeah. Are you pregnant and thinking about what making milk for your baby will be like? Do you wonder why feeding human babies human milk has become so challenging? I'm Lo Nigrosh, a lactation consultant and host of the Milk Making Minutes, a podcast that explores baby feeding through the lens of systemic and cultural barriers. Come listen to others share their insight about their own milk making experiences and empower yourself to feed your own babies in the way that feels best for you. Well, those are all the questions I had. 
Are you ready for some Victorian slang terms? Oh my gosh, I am so excited. So a little known (laughs) fact about me, I studied linguistics in college, but that was like, I don't know, 20 years ago. So (laughs) it's not going to help me now, but I do love linguistics. So that's awesome. You never know. It might help you. I don't know. I don't think it will. (laughs) I shouldn't have even mentioned it because people are going to think I'm going to be better at this than I am. It's too late now. <laughs> I know. All right. Your first term is Kipsy. K Y P S E Y. Kipsy. Okay. So I'm wondering what part of speech it is. I'm thinking it's either a noun or an adjective. It's a noun. It's a noun. Okay. So I think it could be a person who. Is this a is it a positive term or a negative term? Can I? It's ask a positive that? term. It's yeah. a positive term. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I think it might be somebody who is just kind of like their head is in the clouds, and they they just kind of go through life. You know, she she's a kipsy gal. She doesn't really notice the world around to her, and she's just kind of happy and going through life without a care in the world. Hmm. I like that answer. <laughs> that's my guess. My my youngest daughter is Kips is a Kipsy gal, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to Victorian slang, a Kipsy is a basket. Oh yeah, Kipsy gal would be an adjective. Okay, so a Kipsy. It's a basket. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So she, so she could carry a Kipsy. She could carry a Kipsy. Yeah. And just be known as the Kipsy gal who carries baskets everywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have one of those bikes that has the basket on it, just be like, put it in your Kipsy. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to be known as a Kipsy, a Kipsy case. No. No. <laughs> That'd be the last thing you want to be known as. <laughs> Although people would question what it means. So maybe right. it might be a nice conversation starter, but. <laughs> <laughs> She's such a Kipsy case. <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> oh, a kipsy. Hmm. Your second term is Jerusalem pony. Hmm. Well, the first thing I thought of was, <laughs> you know, like the the Bible story of riding a donkey. <laughs> was it actually Jesus who rode a donkey into... Jerusalem or was it somebody else was that even a story (laughs) I'm I'm, uh, trying to go back into my childhood here it was Mary and Joseph it was Mary that rode the donkey into Jerusalem before she gave birth to Jesus yeah but then again like before the crucifixion oh yeah 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 yeah. he did ride a donkey yeah you're right you're right so I was thinking a donkey But I I bet this, does this describe a person? It does not. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go with the donkey. And you are 100% correct. Yes! (laughs) (laughs) I did it! (laughs) You cracked a crab word! I know! I feel like I should win a prize. (laughs) I know. I should have, like, poppers, like confetti poppers when people, like, get it. Yeah, like that sound like, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> and you're like, I won. <laughs> yeah, that's that is a donkey, a Jerusalem pony. You know, you were really good at this because when I said that there was like you had a total p- poker face. I have gotten so good at having the poker face. Like, yeah. Typically, typically I, I like try not to smirk or anything or right. like, I just kind of nod. Uh huh. Yeah. I had no clue that I had gotten it. <laughs> yeah. So listeners, I don't give like facial clues like, yeah. yes, you're on the right track or right. no, that is not yeah. where you need to be going with that. Yeah. So poker face. Yep. That's me. Mm-hmm. That's the only time I have a poker face. I'm sure if I was playing actual poker, I would be horrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You should try. <laughs> I'd have to learn how to play first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
I'm horrible at it because I don't know what I'm doing. Step one, learn <laughs> poker. Step two, use your poker face. Use my face. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would like to thank Lo for joining me today for Can You Crack the Cramp Word? And before we go, can you tell our listeners where they can find you on social media and when new episodes of your podcast come out? Yes. So they can find me both on Instagram. I'm Lo Nigrosh, IBCLC on Instagram. Although there might be an underscore there. We can put it in the show notes. And mm -hmm. then I think it's Low Nigrosh podcast host or something on Instagram. We'll put it in the show notes. And then TikTok, I'm Low Nigrosh IBCLC. TikTok, I actually kind of have fun there because I ask questions and then I get lots of like fun responses. So I might get a question like, "What did your what did your child call nursing?" And then people will give me all sorts of fun responses. So even though I don't have That's tons cool. of followers there, I do get lots of good answers on tiktok so that's really that's fun awesome. and on instagram i do lots of like fun reels like i love okay. the office so anytime i see an office audio you better believe i'm going to be trying <laughs> to figure out a way to talk about <laughs> lactation <laughs> with an office reel that's what i do on instagram that's amazing yeah and then i also do have a facebook community group called the Milk Making Minutes. And there, what we do is we just try to talk about equity in human milk making. I'm sorry, I have a dog barking. I don't know if you can hear it oh, or not. That's okay. okay. It's for parents. It's for people in the perinatal health field. Anyone who is interested in improving equity in human milk making. Sure. We don't do lots of chatter there, but anyone who like wants to post an interesting article, like there's a company that's trying to create fake human milk in the same way that we've created like fake meat. So there was an article oh. posted about that recently, you know, so stuff like that, mm -hmm. that we talk about there. So if anyone wants to join that, the Milk Mickey Minutes community group on Facebook, and you can find my podcast anywhere you find podcasts. Awesome. Well, on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay, and I'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. <laughs>